Welcome back. So now we move on to the next part of the course. And as a motivation for what we are about to do now, I will take a concrete use case. It's the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's trying to store all of the stars and galaxies and all the astronomical objects that we see. Phase four has just, uh, has just now three years ago completed. And now we are in phase five. So I looked up back then how much data that was phase four. And I realized this is 273 terabytes of data. It's 680,000 directories and 176 million files. That's a lot of data, right? So it's uh, hundreds of millions of stars, hundreds of millions of galaxies, uh, more than 1 billion objects on four different spectra, right? Color, infrared, and so on. Now it turns out, and this is actually new, just last month in August, the phase five has released the first data sets, right? So there is already data available for phase five. I took a look at the website. It turns out they have a way to query the data. Guess with what language? SQL, exactly, you got it right. And there is a sandbox there. You can enter SQL queries and query the data. All right, but how do we deal with this, with so much data? How, do they, how did they do that? That's the big question. Well, obviously, it will not fit in a machine, right? You agree, we don't have, we don't have any hard drives that can store uh, 200 terabytes of data. That, uh, that just would be unthinkable. At least today, I mean, maybe in 10 or 20 years, that will be different, right? You never know. Um, so we have relational databases, and uh, typically, these should fit on a single machine, right? If you install PostgreSQL in your Docker environment, it's a single machine. We cannot do this for the SDSS uh, data. It just doesn't fit. Um, but I have good news still. Even though we'll have to find another way, a lot of what was invented in the past 50 years can be reused. In fact, the vast majority of it can be reused. Selections, projections, grouping, sorting, joining, all of that we'll still have in big data at very large scales. That's the beauty of data independence. This still works, even though the physical layer is different. SQL, we'll still have it. Not always, it cannot do everything, but very often we can still use SQL. Uh, we'll still have declarative and functional languages, even if it's not necessarily SQL. We can optimize, we can have query plans and indices. I'll go again in details in a few weeks on indices, B, B plus trees and hash indices. I'll explain to you all of the secrets. The relational model with tables, with rows, with columns, with primary keys, still there. Check, check, check. We still have this at uh, large scales. However, there are compromises that needed to be made in order to do this. And typically, we kind of gave up on some things, like essentially at the beginning, uh, relational integrity, tabular integrity is just the same thing, it's another name, domain integrity, atomic integrity, the second, third, 3.5th, fourth, fifth, and sixth normal forms, Boyce code, that's the 3.5 Boyce code. We needed to give that up. And instead, we came up with new things, uh, handling heterogeneous data, nested data, denormalized data, and so on. So we needed to invent new concepts. I'm not saying we completely gave them up. There are cases where you can still bring that back to life and it makes sense at large scales. I'm just saying not always, right? You might sometimes not have this. So in essence, what will keep us busy throughout the entire semester is to rebuild our stack. This is the stack. Of course, I'm going to put name on that, but that's basically the big data technology stack. It used to be monolithic in the sense that it was on a single machine in the 70s. And we are going to rebuild this stack from the bottom to the top, right, during the entire semester. So very quick overview. We need to store the data. We'll see systems like Amazon S3, Azure Blob Storage, HDFS, uh, and so on, and so on. Your local file system on your laptop is also a potential location for storing the data. Then we see how to encode the data. We'll not spend a lot of time on this. Can be ASCII, UTF-8, BSON is a binary version of JSON, and so on, and so on, and so on. We'll look at syntax. If you store your data in a data lake, you need syntax. So we'll see XML, JSON, YAML, but there's others like Turtle, RDF, XBRL, and so on. So you can store tables, cubes, trees, graphs, right, using these syntaxes. All right, and this is what you put on your data lake, basically. 
Then we have data models. For tables, we've done it, right? It's the relational model that I presented to you. It turns out you can do the same thing for trees, you can do the same thing for graphs, and you can do the same thing for cubes, right? Uh, they have name here that I'm throwing on the slide, but just uh, think that these are different kinds of models, and we'll look into them this semester. Uh, then there is the validation. Why do we need to validate data? Well, in relational databases, this is something we don't care, because in the system, you first start with a schema. You want to put data in a table? Yes. If you come up with a schema first, you need to say which columns you want and what types they have. Well, in big data, we do it kind of topsy-turvy in the sense that we start throwing the data into the lake without really caring if it's actually homogeneous or heterogeneous, and we worry about finding a schema later and cleaning it up. This is called validation, right? And that also we will see. So there are validation technologies, XML schema, JSON schema, JSON. Relational schemas also exist, right? But in that case, typically you do it before you populate the data, XBRL taxonomies for data cubes, and so on. Then we'll have the actual processing. This is where the fun actually begins. I mean, it's also fun to validate data, but processing data is even more fun. Um, and here we'll see uh, MapReduce, uh, Apache Spark, and so on and so on. There's others, of course, but if you know MapReduce and Spark, you will have absolutely no difficulty learning pretty much any system, right? EC2 is just the name that Amazon gives when you rent uh, virtual machines uh, on their servers. So it's a part of what you need for the processing. Uh, it's kind of fun actually because you 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 it's like here you have the laptops you hold it in your hand you switch it on and off but actually when you when you rent machines from amazon you just click a button and it appears and you click a button and it just disappears right so that you cannot do with your laptops at least not today but in the cloud it's just the press of a button to to create and delete machines all right then we have indices i'll spend some time on them in a few weeks b plus trees hash indices that just to accelerate the execution of your queries. Um, then we look at data stores. So this is getting more and more and more uh, uh, like closer to the user. Uh, we'll see uh, in particular MongoDB, but there is also Couchbase, Elasticsearch, Hive implements uh, uh, cubes on top, uh, tables and cubes on top of uh, HBase. HBase is a white column store. We we'll spend, spend a week on that. MarkLogic, Cassandra, and so on have other names for data stores. Data store is kind of the name we give to systems that manage your data, but they are not quite as complete as a full database management system like PostgreSQL or IBM or Oracle, right? So data stores are kind of in the middle, right? They are a bit more basic than a full-fledged system. In particular, they don't all have a high-level query language. The querying APIs are a bit on a lower level. All right, and then the querying, so this turns the whole thing into a database. We have SQL, we'll see JSONIC, there's also XQuery, Nickel, MDX for Cube, Sparkles, REST APIs also on a lower level, and so on. And finally, the user interfaces. Uh, so you can uh, use uh, spreadsheet software, access is also one way, Tableau for visualizations. You can also use, of course, no Jupyter Notebooks with Matplotlibs in Python and so on and so on, right, to deal with the data. In fact, I don't know why I didn't update that slide because this, here, I could have added large language models and chat GPT and Bard and Yama and so on and so on, right? Okay, uh, so this is the ultimate interface with the end user that doesn't even want to write queries in SQL. All right. And of course, we need to start somewhere because that's the entire semester. So that today, we are going to start here with storage, right? So we'll learn how to store our data. Um, so how do we go from a single machine to a cluster of machines, right? This is essentially the challenge that we need to solve for the storage. So I have, I think, two questions that I will ask you, and maybe that will actually lead us to the break. So I will ask you these two questions. So grab the clicker app. You can also do it on Zoom, right? You don't have to be in the lecture hall to do this. So this is the first question that I have for you. What is there in a data center? Is it top secret? Nobody actually knows. Um, is it one really, really, really big machine that's called a supercomputer that has a thousand core CPU, a hundred petabyte disk, and a uh, one petabyte of memory? Or is it just plenty of small cheap machine? 
Or is it a giant quantum computer with an array of 54 qubits? That's actually Sycamore, but without the broken one. Uh, why, for Feynman's sake, would we wait for trillions of core hours to get an answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything? That's the part when I drank my orange juice. All right, what do you say? I have a lot of questions, a lot of answers. And we have a majority, a very, very clear majority. Yeah. And it turns out that you are correct, plenty of small, cheap machines. That might be a surprise at first, but this is actually what there is in a data center. So I'll show you a few pictures and uh, give you the details of that. All right. Then the other question, how do you think electric cars were made more affordable and given more range? Did we completely redesign the car engine to consume less power? Did we completely redesign a battery that would have more range? Did we assemble plenty of cheap, widespread, standard 18650 batteries before Tesla? Or you interned and you were under an NDA, you cannot tell us. There seems to be a majority here as well. Very good. All right. It turns out that you are correct. This is the point where I realized that I wanted to ask the questions in the reverse order. But actually, I didn't even need to because you figured out the data center even uh, using the analogy with electric cars. So yes, we will see in the second hour the motivation for just having plenty of small, cheap uh, components that we assemble into, uh, into a, a big component. Why is that um, easier to do than to try to, to build some huge monolithic design, right? So this is what we will see in the second hour. All right, so I'll give you, maybe it's uh, 57, I'll give you back the extra minutes. So we will start at 15 past three with the continuation of the lecture. So thank you very much and see you in 15 minutes.